Perhaps you could tell us about your earliest days in Edinburgh, Captain Graham. Well, when I was a youngster here, uh, we had a house in uh, Cambridge Gardens, down in Leith. And uh, I went to a little primary school called uh, Lawn Street. And uh, I won a bursary there to the Royal High School. From there, I decided I'd move on to university. And I chose uh, to do modern languages, of German and French, but uh, German is my primary language. I was doing an honours degree, which is four years, and uh, at, after the end of the second year, we were visited by the Foreign Office, and they were seeking for bright young things to join organisations such as the Diplomatic Corps. And uh, I said I was interested, and they said, right, that will mean six months in Germany, six months in France. And uh, this was 1939, and um, getting near the war, of course. And in the summer of 1939, I moved over to Germany to teach English in a boarding school on Lake Constance. And I was teaching 17, 18 year olds English. The sad thing was after the war, I made it my job to try and contact my pupils that I had at uh, Zalem in this boarding school. And there were 18 of them. And uh, I found 17 had been killed in the war. And the one survivor had one leg only. And uh, it puts in perspective the terrible price Germany paid for the war. What were your memories of Edinburgh University at that time before you went to Germany? Oh, university life was fantastic. And um, I loved every minute of it. Uh, they, it's, if you were going to do well, you had to study hard. Um, and uh, that restricted your free time, probably kept you out of trouble. <laughs> and um, generally, I, I couldn't have been happier with life when I was here. You mentioned that you graduated in 1947. That sounds like quite a commitment. Oh, it was, yes. I was very keen to. I thought, what a pity going to a university and not coming out with an end result. And that's really what kept me going. And uh, the fact that the old staff I knew was still there and was still so keen to help me, uh, they went out of their way. There were, there were three of them, Professor Bruford, Mr. Regling, and a lovely lady called Estelle McElvenna. And they all helped me through that period. Estelle McElvenna sent me books and said, read them. And um, then Eggling would send me actual exam papers uh, to complete and see if I was up and running at that stage. And um, as I said, they just nurtured me along. And, uh, you know, you don't expect this after you've left a university. What are your memories of uh, post-war Germany, just, just at the very end of the war? To be honest with you, it was like being on the moon. The destruction, the scale of the destruction was incredible. Any major city, or even pretty big city, was in total ruin. I mean, not just damaged, total ruin. And um, people were wandering around like zombies, lost human beings. Um, just immediately after, when the capitulation was declared, uh, there were just thousands of Germans trying to find their way home to their own original town, and if it existed. Winston Churchill had given us three priorities to do. One was firstly to capture the German supersonic wind tunnels then find their advanced jet aircraft and their advanced rocket aircraft, bring it 
home examples of those, test them. Finally, find their top scientists and uh, interrogate them and um, bring them back. And I, I brought to uh, help to bring back 26 of the top scientists. And I believe you were involved in Nuremberg? Uh, and interrogated Himmler, uh, well, not a lot. I, mainly identification of him, but had a good chance to have a go at Goering. Uh, another wonderful one was Werner von Braun, uh, uh, who is the most incredible, one of the most incredible men I've ever met. Such self-confidence. Uh, this guy, in the middle of a war, he wasn't captured, he gave himself up. And when he did, he said to the Americans, aren't you the lucky ones to have me? Because I'm going to take you to the moon. Talk about self-confidence. This was the sort of guy he was. In everything he touched, he was like this. He wanted to be a pilot, took him two and a half hours to go solo. Could you maybe just tell us a little bit about where your career took you at that time? Yes. Well, after the war, um, I was still at that time the chief naval test pilot at Farnborough when the war ended. It was some of the other companies were also trying to get me to join them. And um, Farnborough wouldn't have any of this because I was involved in some top secret work. And they said, oh no, we can't let you go, you've got to stay on. And I said, well, you've got to give me a job uh, uh, to stay on. Uh, uh, so the Navy said, right, we'll give them a, a commission. And um, so that's why I stayed on as, as a naval pilot. And when my flight testing days were done, I just became an ordinary squadron pilot. You were back in Edinburgh in 2007 uh, to get an honorary degree. What are your memories of that day? Wonderful. My best fond friend after the war was Neil Armstrong, the um, astronaut. Uh, we knew each other for about 30 odd years. And uh, we used to lecture quite a bit together. And um, Neil, I found out that his background was being a good Armstrong. He came from the borders and the family came from Langham, which is just down the road from Melrose. And um, so we ta that was partly the reason we became great friends. And um, when we I heard that we were both to be made um, or offered um, doctorships, um, we decided we'd do it together. But Neil's commitments wouldn't allow that. And he was very disappointed, but um, to his surprise, the Edinburgh's Council said, right, we'll come over to America and do the honours there. Hearty congratulations. Can you tell us a little bit more about your relationship with Neil Armstrong, how, how you first uh, got to meet one another? Yes, well, Neil and I were both flying at an airfield called Bedford. Uh, at uh, lunchtime one day, and I was flying a helicopter, and I needed a quiet airfield to myself because I was doing a special job. And Neil was the only one that was up in the air at the time. And uh, air traffic control said, well, you, we can give you an hour, but then we're having an airplane coming back then, so if you can come back at the same time. So I came back at the end of the hour, and uh, Neil had landed just, um, I think, ahead of me. And we got in, a Land Rover came to pick us up and take us to mess. And he was the most famous guy in, on the planet, and I didn't recognize him. Uh, and he introduced himself. And of course, I thought, oh, you fool. And this guy, you know, everybody knows him. And, uh, he was very nice, and we went to the mess and uh, had lunch together. And during that time, we talked. Never, we never mentioned the moon, either of us. And um, 
we talked about uh, the Border Reefers uh, and his ancestry in Langham and all that sort of stuff. And this is what well melded us together. We'd both been naval pilots, test pilots, borderers, border reefers. And they, well, he said, you know, we're kindred spirits. We must stick together. And uh, that's how it all happened. Fascinating. You had an incredible career. Would you have liked to have followed in his footsteps and gone into space? No, I'd prefer to. And incidentally, it's an interesting question. I often asked Neil, would you sooner have been an astronaut or a test pilot? And he said, despite the going to the moon, I'd sooner have been a test pilot. 